everybody. So we're going to be continuing uh, this lecture with talking about remote sensing. We were introducing remote sensing last class. Uh, and this class, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the spectrum and talk about uh, spectral, uh, the different characteristics or different things that we can do with remote sensing because we can divide the spectrum into so many different parts and we can increase the spectral resolution to kind of give you an idea of what you may be able to do with remote sensing uh, that's not just look at uh, an image as if it were an aerial photo because we said that that's an important thing, uh, a subject matter that we could talk about, aerial photography. Uh, photogrammetry is what they call the mathematical uh, measurement of photos to get information off of it. A lot of stuff you can do with that. Uh, but then there's a lot of stuff that you can do with remote sensing that isn't just the uh, interpretation of a photograph, just the interpretation of a photograph, so to speak. Uh, and it largely has to do with the power that being able to chop the spectrum up into a bunch of different uh, parts allows us to have. We were talking about the different kinds of resolution that we have in remote sensing. And uh, we had said uh, spatial resolution, which is talking about the size of the cell that the uh, raster that the satellite system returns is going to give you. And so obviously it's collecting information every 30 meters. You're going to have a much higher spatial resolution than if you're only able to collect uh, information every one kilometer, for instance. Uh, then the next thing that we talked about was radiometric resolution. And that was the ability to, for the sensor to be able to distinguish between levels of intensity of the return of whatever it is that sensor is measuring. In the case of electromagnetic radiation, can you get a, a really um, a sensitive measurement about exactly how much radiation of that kind is reflecting back from the particular little uh, area that's being measured at that time, or is it rather coarse? Um, and then the next thing we talked about was spectral resolution. And that's how finally you can chop up the electromagnetic spectrum. I was giving you the example of a photograph as a, sort of uh, an analogy for a satellite uh, photo or satellite image. Your spatial resolution, if you're taking a, a photo, is very important. You want high um, pixels, not a large number of pixels in order to take a nice clear photograph. Likewise, you don't want just to know whether or not light is reflecting off of your friend or not when you're taking the photo. You want to know how much so you can get that nice, you know, stretched along a gray scale so you know you've got some areas that are very dark, some areas that are very light. But then if you want to introduce color, you're not only going to want to know what's the intensity of light that's reflecting off of whatever it is you're taking a picture of, uh, but you'll also want to know what particular wavelength that radiation was. Is it blue? Is it red? Is it green? Is it some kind of mix? So spatial radiometric, uh, spectral, and the last one I gave you uh, at the very end uh, was uh, temporal, which means how long it's going to be before a particular satellite or a particular system in general is able to take another image of the same area. So if you have very high spatial or very high temporal resolution, you could think that sort of the highest temporal resolution would be if you're taking a frame, taking an image like 30 times a second. Typically, you know, movies play at 26, 28, up to like 30. Of course, now we have high frame rate. But you know, in order for us to detect just general movement with our eyes, maybe if you take an image every 30 seconds and then play it back in that real time, you're basically taking video. We don't really have that so much with uh, satellite imagery, but uh, we do have, oh, it's every month or every six months or every three months, you may be able to re-image an area depending on the orbit of the satellite. So let's get back into talking about spectral resolution. And this is another reason why you can collect just absolutely huge amounts of data when you're talking about satellite images. Because in our basic example, we said we have the visible light here. Of course, the spectrum is very long, but we've got visible light here um, that uh, if we've got uh, shorter wavelengths over here, uh, uh, we can say generally this over here is blue light this over here at this wavelength, we register it as green light. Then we move over here toward red light, and then we would move into infrared and so forth. We don't want, in order to have a black and white image, we said, you know, you, we may be looking at some kind of object 
that has very low reflectivity of blue and a lot of low reflectivity in green, but high reflectivity in red. Likewise, you might have something with very high blue reflectivity, very, high, very low green and low red reflectivity, or something that does like this. But if they're all going up to the same amount, you've got the same amount of reflectivity, if you have rather low spectral resolution, your remote sensing system is only going to return a single number for that particular cell that's being measured. Maybe, I think I gave the example of 102 last time. How much have you got? 102. Of some kind of light reflecting off of uh, that object in the visible spectrum. But uh, that doesn't tell us what color it is. There's still more information that we would like to be able to get. I remember when I was a kid learning about the spectrum, and I was, it, it, this didn't seem real intuitive to me, because I assumed that you know, if I'm wearing a, you know, a blue shirt here, that it means that blue light, you know, that wavelength is kind of sticking to my shirt, right? But remember, it's the opposite way, that we perceive the color of something based on what kind of light reflects off of it. So my shirt right here is reflecting red. I mean, excuse me. It is absorbing red uh, wavelength light. It's absorbing green wavelength light, and it's reflecting the blue. So the blue, the light with the blue uh, wavelength is bouncing off this part of my shirt and into your eyes, and that's why you perceive this as blue. So it's the same thing when you're talking about remote sensing. You're detecting whatever is bouncing off of whatever object it is, not what's being absorbed. Everything absorbs uh, some wavelengths of light and then it, or electromagnetic radiation in general, and it also reflects some. So we're always picking up what's being reflected. So if we want to be able to distinguish these two things, or these three things, we might increase the spectral resolution of our sensor and say, I want to be able to not just look over the entire visible spectrum and get one particular reading on that. I want to design a new system that goes from you know, this area to this area of the spectrum. Give me a reading on this. Give me a reading on this area to this area. Give me a reading from this area to this area. Uh, and then we would be able to distinguish between, oh, in a particular cell, low reflectance, low reflectance, high reflectance, it must be red. Now we run into the problem that because a raster, you only get to have one value per raster, uh, one value per cell in a raster. So how are you going to record all of this? You do this by capturing multiple rasters. So when you get a satellite image or you buy a satellite image or you download a satellite image, you're not actually just downloading one thing, you know, like you might think of a picture being one thing. When you download a satellite image, you're going to get a new raster for every, and I think at the very end I said this word as well, band that the satellite image has. So you could have, uh, I think some of the Landsat satellites most commonly have seven bands. They're able to break the spectrum down into seven different chunks, uh, including infrared. You can build a satellite uh, detector that detects things outside of the visible spectrum. So in that case, if you have a satellite image from Landsat, you'll have seven different rasters. And then it will tell you, okay, raster number one or band number one is the reflectivity in this part of the spectrum. And then band number two is reflectivity in the next part of the spectrum. And all of that's in the specifications for all of the data that uh, you download. And then in the lab, we have uh, some Landsat imagery actually for you to work with so you can see this for yourself. So that's why in many cases, satellite imagery not only is raster data take up a lot of space in general, but you're talking about not one raster anyway, you're talking about a whole collection of them. Uh, when you're talking about something like seven bands, that's fairly manageable in general, but there's nothing that actually stops you from carving the spectrum up into as many different parts as you want. And they have hyperspectral hyperspectral remote sensing and then also ultraspectral remote sensing and these don't have exactly you know crisp deline delineations about when something becomes hyper or ultraspectral but basically these are terms that we use 
for different sensor systems that break up the spectrum in the visible light and outside of visible light into hundreds or even thousands of different bands. And so that's when they also talk about getting a data cube that when you download or get otherwise get access to some satellite image, you get access to an entire data cube because it may have thousands of different bands. You've got these tiny, tiny little slivers of the spectrum and every raster you're looking at is the reflectance value in, in, a, in a very, you know, extremely narrow uh, area. And that generates its own problems. I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is one of the sources of sort of big data in our society because you can be handed gigabytes, terabytes of data when you collect over an area. And uh, actually your problem in that situation becomes how do I determine what kind of data is relevant to what I'm trying to do and what is not. And so they actually develop, the first thing they do is develop all these different techniques and use these different techniques to try to determine what of these, this terabyte data cube I've got here is actually even relevant to what I'm trying to look at and what's not. If you're trying to find some kind of a tree or detect water quality or whatever. Uh, so you can get into having so much data that the first thing you have to do is figure out what exactly you can throw away uh, in these situations.